The next talk we will have will be given by um, Dr. Patrick Salter on precision laser manufacturing enabling advanced technologies. Uh, Patrick is an early career EPSRC, that's Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council Research Fellow, working on using short pulsed laser fabrication to enable new functional devices based upon synthetic diamond. He's also a junior research fellow at New College. So I'll hand over to Patrick for his presentation. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Martin. Um, <clears throat> uh, my name is Patrick Salter, and I'm going to be talking today about precision laser manufacturing, enabling advanced technologies, which actually kind of follows on quite nicely from the talk that Ben Kay has just given about using laser cutters for making the bioreactor. Uh, but what does this title mean, precision laser manufacturing? Uh, let's just first ask ourselves a question. And what connects these different things. We've got the Large Hadron Collider based at CERN in Geneva, and we've got some gemstones, some diamonds, some sapphire. Uh, let's throw in some lasers as well, and then finally uh, we've got some liquid crystal TVs. Actually, when we look at it now, this does seem a bit like the plot of a James Bond movie, but hopefully over the next few minutes we'll start to see what the connections are here and why they're important. <coughs> Let's start, first of all, just with the environment. So the Large Hadron Collider is certainly a high radiation environment. Particles are accelerated round, uh, close to the speed of light, and then smashed into each other to look for new applications in physics. Doesn't sound like a particularly nice place to be, uh, but there are actually lots of similar such of harsh environments which are really quite technologically important today. Areas such as inside a nuclear reactor, high voltage power transmission, gas turbines. Um, as we look for efficiency and safety improvements in energy generation and transfer, it starts to become important that we can embed sensor technology in these inhospitable places such that we can see exactly what is happening in real time. To put sensors in these nasty places, we need to have materials which are going to be able to survive. And for that, we're going to have to work with some unusual hard materials that can withstand high temperature and or radiation. That's where the gemstones come in. For a long time, these stones have been admired for their optical quality, but they're also known to be among the hardest materials on Earth. So maybe they can be of some use here. However, it would clearly be crazy to start thinking about using high-value diamonds, sapphires uh, as sensors in horrible places. Uh, but with recent advances in material growth, we actually have a fantastic opportunity. Uh, it's now possible to grow useful sizes of high-quality single crystal diamond, sapphire, or silicon carbide, and that gives us lots of opportunity for making robust sensor devices. Okay, so we've got these hard materials and they can withstand really horrible environments. But how are we going to actually process them to make functional devices? That's where the lasers come in. Uh, now, rest assured that the safety office don't allow us to do anything nearly like this up in the lab, but lasers are starting to become increasingly common in manufacturing scenarios, and it's known that they're useful for processing, cutting, drilling, and forming hard materials. However, in this traditional operation, there's a lot of heat involved. We can see sparks flying out of the material here. And that heat limits what we can do, both in terms of the sort of feature sizes we can manufacture and in the terms of types of devices we can make. <coughs> um, a solution to this comes with going shorter. So around 30 years ago, Donna, Donna Strickland, working with Gerald Maru, developed a technique to create really short, intense pulses of laser light, something for which they recently won the Nobel Prize. Now, these pulses of light are shorter than a millionth of a millionth of a second. And then think about that just for a moment, because it's really quite incredible when you start thinking about that time scale. But from a manufacturing perspective, what is important there is that this time scale is shorter than that for thermal diffusion. So we can get all of our energy from our laser pulse into the material before any starts spreading away as heat. Why is that important? As we can see from this graphic here taken from the Nobel lecture, 
When we can get that energy in in a very short time scale, it limits the amount of heating that happens in the material, and it limits the amount of shock waves that cause damage deeper inside the material. And that really opens the door for this precision laser manufacturing. If we couple that with high angle focusing, so we focus our light down at really high angle, we can generate laser spots which are smaller than the wavelength of light. Then we can start thinking about creating features with our laser right technique, which are far smaller than a thousandth of a millimeter, and open the door to new types of devices. OK, so we can make small features, and we're almost there. But is this enough? To make our sensors really robust, they should ideally be embedded within the hard materials that we're using. So they should be located deep beneath the surface where they don't degrade. How can we manufacture that, though, with our lasers? We know that materials such as diamond are transparent, so surely all of the light just goes straight through the diamond when we shine our laser on it. Actually, we already have the answer, uh, which comes when we focus light down, both in space and time. So we're already focusing the light down in space with our tight angle focusing, and we're compressing it in time with these incredibly short laser pulses. And it turns out that when we do that, at the focus of our laser, we've got an incredibly high electric field. That electric field is strong enough to rip electrons out of their binding and start causing material modification. In many ways, this can be thought of as uh, equivalent, uh, rather than having a single photon absorption, absorbing multiple photons of light at the same time. The important thing, though, is the only place where there is enough uh, a strong enough electric field or enough intensity in the light that our laser focus. And that limits where we do the machining. So that if we take our transparent material and trace it in three dimensions through our laser focus, we get very accurate machining, manufacturing, just where the laser focus is. And that enables us to trace out these very high resolution, small length scale features in three dimensions embedded deep inside our hard materials. <coughs> okay, so now we're almost there. <coughs> uh, but first we have to deal with a slight annoyance which harks back from our school level physics. It turns out that when we focus the light inside our transparent materials, we get refraction at the interface and the light ray rays change direction. This is just Snell's law that some of you might remember from school, uh, and is the same principle as why light changes angle when it passes through a prism, or why things appear closer when we see them inside a swimming pool. Here, it's really quite a problem, though, for our manufacturing, because as those light rays change direction, they blur out our nice, tight laser focus and impair our ability to effectively fabricate devices. So this is where the optical engineering comes in and the liquid crystal TVs. We're all familiar with liquid crystal displays from our everyday life as an effective way to uh, modulate the amplitude of light. So that's how a display works. Well, we can use exactly the same technology to modulate the phase of our laser beam whilst we're doing the manufacturing. We take the same technology and we compress it down. So here's a device in our lab, uh, a little liquid crystal display here illuminated by the green laser. Um, which is just two centimeters across, but still with full HD definition. And that enables us to spatially control the phase of the laser beam. And that gives us a lot of opportunity when we do the manufacturing. Now that we can spatially control the phase, we can actually control the angles of the different light rays as they're coming into our material. And we can undo the effects of refraction, restoring our really nice, tight laser focus anywhere inside the material, allowing us to make functional devices. This is incredibly powerful, and a nice example of this comes when we do some laser manufacturing inside diamond to make a sensor. When we uh, shine our laser inside the diamond workpiece, we break the diamond down into a graphite phase. It is all just carbon after all. Now, graphite conducts electricity, whereas diamond is known as an excellent insulator. So we can start to think about maybe writing electrical connections and circuitry, which are embedded deep inside the diamond, and that starts to now think, look a bit more like a sensor. 
However, if we don't apply our nice optical control with the liquid crystal TVs, we find that the breakdown of the diamond into graphite is very poor. Here it looks pretty fuzzy, and these wires don't conduct. However, if we apply our optical control using the liquid crystal technology to shape our laser beam, we find that the breakdown of the diamond is far more efficient. If we look at the image here, we see that we're generating a really dense black graphite feature, a wire where we want to, and importantly for devices, the resistivity drops by orders of magnitude, and that starts to make devices realizable. What might these devices look like? Well, we simply write uh, wires inside the diamond that can act as internal electrodes. When a high energy particle, and it could really be anything, uh, passes through our diamond, uh, it generates some charge as it passes through the diamond. It liberates some electrons, generates whole pairs, uh, much in the same way as a, a classic cloud chamber experiment might do. If we put a voltage across our internal electrodes that we've laser written inside the diamond, then we, we get a bias field such that we can collect that charge which is generated when the high energy particle interacts with the diamond. We can make this pixelated so we get spatial information about whether different particles are interacting with the detector. Also, the amount of charge we collect gives us information on the momentum and the species of the particle that is interacting with the detector. All of this is completely encased inside this really radiation-hard diamond material, which makes for a very robust sensor uh, and is quite powerful for nasty environments. I've been working on these style of detectors for about the past five years, working as part of the RD42 collaboration at CERN, and the results from the test beams that we've been getting are very encouraging. Here are a few different examples. So a typical diamond chip might be about five millimeters across and have somewhere in the range of about 10,000 pixels, laser written inside, manufactured upstairs here in Oxford. Uh, here's a different example of a detector chip trialing out different electrode configurations. Uh, these are working nicely. They're giving charge collection efficiencies above 99%, with electrode yields, again, above 99%. And that's so good that now we're starting on a program of work that is going to be uh, installing these detectors, manufactured in the labs here in Oxford as part of the LHC upgrade in 2024 in the ATLAS experiment. And I think that's really quite exciting and a very nice translation of our fundamental work here on optical control of laser beams, showing how it can be applied to manufacturing and then used in applications. <coughs> These devices aren't just useful for high energy physics experiments, though. We're also exploring many different opportunities related to nuclear power and high voltage power electronics, again, with exactly the same kinds of devices here with internal laser written circuitry embedded inside diamond. The laser manufacturing can also provide advantages in new emerging fields, too. Here in the arena of quantum computing that my colleague Dominic O'Brien will be discussing in just a few minutes' time, uh, diamond holds many advantages as well. The rigid diamond lattice can act as a really nice stable host for quantum bits. Here, a quantum bit is just a single defect uh, inside the, the diamond lattice, a missing carbon atom uh, which is bound with a nitrogen atom. Uh, these defects fluoresce, they emit light, and the amount of light that they uh, give out tells you something about their quantum state. As it's all encased inside the diamond lattice, they have very long coherence times and they can be operated at room temperature. A lot of the existing physics experiments using these defects inside the diamond rely on as grown defects, so things that occur randomly during the growth process. The physicists hunt around for them and they find them and then they use them for their experiments. That's good for proof of principle, but isn't, isn't relevant for an industrially scalable technology. We showed that with the laser process, we were able to generate these individual quantum bits inside a diamond wafer with incredibly high positioning accuracy, and they also showed excellent quantum properties. Here, as we see in this fluorescence image over here on the left, the fluorescence that we see is from a single angstrom scale defect inside the diamond. Uh, the positioning accuracy is excellent. The 
precision is at about 50 nanometers, and we introduced an optical form of feedback which gives us 100% yield. This is a really important step towards realizing integrated quantum technologies. It's not just diamond either, uh, and we've started making sensors in other hard materials such as sapphire, which is slightly cheaper and easier to grow. In this example, we see a sapphire fiber in which we've used the laser process to write a channel which can guide light. If we look closely, we see that there's a slight modulation in the size of the channel, uh, and that has a period of about a micron. When we send light down our channel, we get a strong resonant reflection when the wavelength of the light matches the periodicity in our channel. And now we can think about using this as a temperature sensor. If we heat the sapphire fiber up, this periodicity slightly changes, and then we can detect that as a wavelength shift in the reflected light signal. These devices are robust at above 1,000 degrees centigrade and uh, can be completely uh, operated remotely with a, as an optical sensor. We're exploring these for initial applications inside jet engines where they can be embedded to give uh, real-time feedback on the local conditions during flight to optimize efficiency and lifetime. There's also uh, opportunities we're exploring here in the nuclear sector, uh, particularly to do with nuclear fusion. Okay, and then we go full circle back to the gemstones we were looking at earlier. Of course, the same technology could be used to write identifiers inside diamond gemstones. In 2017, we formed the company Obsidia, licensing techno the technology from the university to write serial numbers and logos deep beneath the surface of diamond gems. These identifiers are useful in promoting ethical gem trade and supporting traceability initiatives. We can create a range of different identifiers up from these sort of highly visible uh, marks here, the serial numbers, which can be read by a customer using a simple jeweler's loop, all the way through to very tiny little marks which uh, avoid the detection of a grader, so don't impact the value of a stone. There are now many thousands of gems in the consumer marketplace that bear an Obsidian inscription, as per this example from Lightbox Jewelry, with a laser-written Lightbox logo deep beneath the table of the stone. And it's fantastic to see the potential for rapid translation uh, of technology out of the university research labs. In just under a year, the talented team of engineers at Obsidia, including many graduates from this department, were able to take what we had in the university research labs and transform it into a commercial unit that can be shipped abroad and run 24-7 at high volumes by an untrained operator. Okay, thanks very much for listening. I hope you found this interesting. Uh, we've had a bit of a look at precision laser manufacturing, how we can put some optical control in there to improve it, and uh, how that is then useful in manufacturing functional devices in hard materials for extreme environments. I'd like to pay tribute to uh, the fantastic students who have con contributed to this work. Here's me in the lab with a couple of them. That's what it looks like when we're actually doing the experiments. And of course, a lot of this work is only uh, possible because of collaboration as well. We work with teams in industry and academia, both here in the UK and abroad. Okay, thanks for listening. I'd welcome any questions.